So I wanted to make a video on a tiny little interval that I find fascinating called the syntonic comma. And the syntonic comma is very tiny. It's way smaller than the normal tones and semitones that we find on a piano. What I was really struggling for was a way to demonstrate it in a way that would make sense, not necessarily on a piano keyboard, not with graphs, but auditorially what this actually is. So musical intervals are ratios of frequencies. So if I have a set of strings here, each one of these vibrates at a certain number of cycles per second. And the interval between them, these are all turned in, tuned in perfect fifths. The ratio between those is three to two. So for every time this string vibrates, this string vibrates one and a half times, or put more simply, for every two times that this string vibrates, that string vibrates three times. So this is a ratio of three to two. This is how violins are tuned, and that's how all the strings. That's how all the strings are tuned. Um, now, there's an easy way to demonstrate this and it's using harmonics. So normally when we bow, we'll pluck the string. The string's vibrating at, it, at its fundamental pitch. So it's vibrating at its longest length and lowest um, natural ringing frequency. But we can force it by touching, by touching certain points on the string, certain integer fractions along the string, we can force it to vibrate at other vibrational modes, at other um, Harmonics. So the first one, so we'll start on the lowest string because it's probably easiest to hear. So that's vibrating. So we've cut the string in half. So each half of the string is vibrating twice as fast. We can do it in thirds. So each of the strings vibrates at a certain, at a certain frequency, at a certain pitch, and it's determined by the, um, by the mass of the string, by the tension of the string, and by the length of the string. Um, when the string vibrates at its lowest resonant frequency, at the full length of the string, we call it the fundamental. If we subdivide the string, into some integer length, like half, third, or a fourth, we say the string is vibrating at one of its partial frequencies or a harmonic. When we cut it in half, the frequency of that partial is twice the resonant frequency of the string. So before I told you that these, the ratios between these strings, the way they're tuned on a violin, is related to the ratio, or, or, or is the ratio three to two, which means that one of the ways we can tune a violin, one of, the, one of the ways we can check that a violin is in tune, is with the harmonics. So for example, on the D string, if I take the first partial, the second harmonic, which sounds an octave above the resonant frequency of the string. And check it against the third harmonic on the G string.
we see that they're the same note, even though the strings' fundamental pitches are different. So that's where their harmonics line up, and that's why they're in tune, is because they have harmonics that are low integer numbers that line up somewhere in the stack of, of, of um, the harmonic sequence. So one, a half, a third, a fourth, a fifth. So somewhere in there, um, there is a match up between the two of these. And what, what's actually happening is that as the sound waves propagate through the air, the least common multiple of those two numbers, every whatever that um, least common multiple is, that's how many waves it takes for them to line up again. And that's why when we play things like perfect fifths, we have this deep growl sort of sound. It's where those waves are lining up and interfering constructively and then destructively. And you get this, this fast um, beating phenomenon that sounds more like a homogeneous sound than it does, um, you know, if you had a, a, a much more complex interval, something that's out of tune. you get beats that are much further apart, and that's why it doesn't sound in tune. So, to circle back to the topic of the, the syntonic comma, um, the syntonic comma is way smaller than these ratios of th 3 to 2, or 4 to 5, or 5 to 6. Um, the syntonic comma is actually the ratio of 81 to 80. So to combine intervals, we multiply the frequency ratios. So, for example, to combine two octaves together, which has an octave of uh, ratio of 2 to 1, we multiply the two together, you get two octaves as a ratio of 4 to 1. Um, where this starts to get complex, or where you start to run into issues, is when you start to mix in intervals that have numbers that aren't just 2s or aren't just 3s. See, there's a fundamental fact about numbers. Um, the numbers are either prime or products of primes. It's the definition of prime numbers. It's the inverse of the de definition of prime numbers. Prime number is a number that has factors of only itself and one by definition, but um, factors of only itself. It has no prime factors because it is prime. So to take the inverse of that, all numbers, all non-prime numbers must only have prime factors. You can factor any number in, down into just primes, and if you cannot factor a number any further, that is the definition of being prime. So what that means is if I have a number, if I, if I have a ratio that contains fives, for example, the ratio five to four, there's no way I can multiply ratios of three to two to get to that. There's no way I can multiply ratios of three to two to get to ratios of five to four. It's a number theory problem, it's impossible. It has to do with, with the, the fundamental properties of numbers and prime numbers. So what that means is if, for example, I have the note G. And I want to play um, a sixth above that. I want to play an E above G. sure I get that really, really, really in tune. I lock in, there's a growl to it. Well, so E can be part of other harmonies too. So let's say I wanted to play an E and an A together. So let's look at, let's look at two particular ratios where we might have a conflict. Um, the first one is the major sixth, which has a ratio of um, 8 to 5, and the other is the perfect fourth, which has a ratio of 3 to 4. So one of these, the sixth, has a 5 in it. It's a bigger prime factor. It's the biggest prime factor here. The other one, 3 to 2, has factors of 3, 2, and 2. What we're, what we, what we're asking numbers to do is, you know, we're asking them to be able to multiply together and line up somewhere along the harmonic series with factors of 2 and 3 and factors of 3 and 5. And it's impossible to do that, and I can demonstrate that. So we take, we'll look at the sixth first. We'll look at the sixth between, major sixth between G and E, which is a ratio of 8 to 5. So 
So I'm playing an open G string here. And then I'm playing this E here. On the D string. So one of these is fixed by the tuning of the instrument. And the other one is... Tunable. With my finger. So, G and E, major sixth. Let's look at another interval which also uses that very same E, and that's going to be tuned to the A above it. Now remember that the A on this instrument are tuned together, not directly, there's a string in between them, but, but they are tuned together, they're tuned to a ratio um, that's related to 3 to 2 and 3 to 2. So if you look at that, that harmony of um, stacked fifths, they have this, they share this middle note, D, that links them both together by ratios of 3 to 2. So these, although they're not practically, when you tune the instrument, you don't tune them together, they are tuned together. Major ninth. So let's look at the, our, our other harmony, which includes that same E we were using before. And we're going to use the A string above it, so we're going to play a fourth. You hear how nice, nice and resonant and in tune that is? This E here blends perfectly with the A above it. Now, where we run into trouble are when we have chords, when we have harmonies, where this E is first a fourth with the A, or first a um, sixth with the G, and then it becomes, it moves either from a harmony that's a sixth or a third to a fourth or a fifth. First, we're going to play the E as a sixth with the G. Now, I'm not going to move my finger at all. I'm going to leave it in the exact same spot. Otherwise, I'm not. Other words, I'm not going to retune this E. And listen to how it sounds with the A. We just heard it played in tune with the A. We know. I know I, that that particular interval is a consonant in tune sounding interval. Now, I haven't moved my finger at all. It's still in tune with the G. Hear how out of tune that is? I have to move my finger up. I have to shift it up and shorten the string by just a little bit. Out of tune, in tune. And I'm not moving my finger by much. I'm not retuning that E by much. It's So there it is in tune, I won't move my finger, and we'll go back to the G string. That E sounds way too sharp, you can hear it beating, it's out of tune, very out of tune. So this interval, this E, That E has a frequency ratio of 80 to 81 with that one. So it's a very small interval. It's much smaller than these big Y intervals that you get from the open strings like 3 to 2 or 5 to 4 with sixths, with thirds rather, or 8 to 5 with sixths. Um, so it's an important, it's a very important interval. It doesn't show up on, on our keyboards um, and it's tuned out by. Um, a lot of uh, temperaments. Um, most most of the time, we're trying to avoid needing to have multiple E's or A's or G's. We don't we don't want to have to have um, tens of thousands of keys on a keyboard, so we tune it out. We we um, we pick a middle ground between um, two versions of the same notes, and how we do that is related to the temperament we tune. 
uh, we tend to use. And in, you know, in, in equal temperament, all of our intervals are out of tune. So we have no perfectly um, justly tuned ratios. And it's a compromise we make for having things like A flat and G sharp be the same note. Um, and that works much better for the music that we tend to play on pianos. But we do make compromises and all intervals are out of tune because of it. So um, it certainly can be a, a, um, an item of um, frustration if you're playing um, if you're playing chords on um, an unfretted instrument and you're, you're being very precise about where your fingers go, you have to move them. You have to retune notes. You have to be going along with your sustained notes with all this changing harmony around it. You have to, you know, all of your notes have to change. I mean, you know, it may look the same. It may be tied across the bar line. It's, oh, it's an E here and an E here, but oh, no, you have to drop it by a syntonic comma or raise it by a syntonic comma, depending on what that note is as a function within the chord. So I just thought that was really interesting. I thought I'd share. Um, if any of you are subscribed to my channel for videos on the harpsichord, um, I have moved um, for the second time since buying it. It's out in the living room. Um, you should expect videos coming soon on that. I really want to get going on that. And there's, um, there's way more um, interesting tuning videos that I can show um, once we get that as well. So I mean, expect more stuff like this and then of course expect um, some, some interesting music I'd really like to do. Um, you know, play, be able to play uh, continuo parts for half the violin sonatas I know. So, um, looking forward to that. Um, so that should be that should be good. Just wanted to share that. Thank you.